So welcome to this Cycling Life Leadership Bites. My name is Jamie Anderson, and I'm going to be joined by my co-host today, uh, Alan Davis. Uh, and we're going to be introducing Jell Karlstrom. Jell, I hope I pronounced your name right. Was, was that okay? Pretty close. Uh, yeah, I, if I do a small intro, it's uh, Jell Karlstrom. Jell Karlstrom. Uh, well, yeah, uh, Jell, yeah. Well, you know, where, it's you know, it's I a mean, difficult one. You know that Alan and I are both Australian, so we're kind of linguistically handicapped when it comes to most other, you know, language. Although Alan speaks a few languages, but it's great to have you here. Um, in fact, what we might start by doing—I mean, I mentioned that you're uh, you're working with the uh, Israel uh, startup nation, but maybe you can just do a quick introduction to yourself, and then we'll get it, get into the interview. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so, hi everybody. I'm uh, Chell Karsten from uh, Finland. I I lived uh, here since I stopped my career in end of 11 and I was 10 years pro and after that I've been a sports director with I am cycling and now a uh, general manager for Israel Startup Nation. So okay. and in Finland I, I live with uh, my wife and three kids. And I think we can we can maybe hear some of those kids in the background or is that is that Alan's kids in the background? I think yeah, it was Alan. As the usual on cue my kids are just saying hello to I guess. <laughs> That's great. I mean, Joe, you, Joe, you're also being a little bit humble because, I mean, you, you had quite an incredible career. I mean, we're writing for Liquid Gas, for Team Sky. I mean, multiple Tour de France rider. You've ridden many of the top races uh, around the world. Um, I mean, Alan, you know Kiel well, so why don't you kick off with the, uh, with the questions? Yeah, thank you, Jamie, and welcome again, Kiel. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on here, mate, after knowing you for so long during in the peloton and now after the peloton with our relationship. I'll start off, mate, with taking it back a little bit and just getting to know and asking you a question. Where, how was it for you growing up in Finland and how did you find your way into cycling? Well, uh, it was, I think, uh, well, first of all, Finland hasn't got a lot of tradition in cycling, but I happen to live in, in, in a town called Porvo, which um, has maybe the, the longest traditions inside um, road cycling. And uh, I actually started, I think that the seed was planted when I was uh, in, uh, in daycare at, uh, at one of the greatest cyclists throughout time in Finland. And his, his um, wife was taking care of me during, during the day. So I guess that was the, the start and it, that started already at nine months. So I, I don't know, but yeah, uh, then um, their, their um, oldest son was, was, uh, is exactly the same age as me. And, and we used to ride our bikes all around uh, the countryside where we lived. And, and I was always uh, left a little bit behind um, and I blamed it on his nice bike. It was a motobekan. Uh, 10 gears and I had an old uh, I don't remember if it was an Helkama which is a Finnish brand with only three gears and uh, yeah at some point he got angry and said Let, buy a bike buy a real bike and then we'll see and I, I convinced my dad uh, to to chip in and and then I I started cycling and was it did it come easy for you Jal, I mean, did, did, did you realize early on that you had a talent for this sport? I mean, so, so how did that evolve in your teenage years? And then yeah. how did you eventually step up to, to racing at the national? Because you were multiple national champion as well in Finland. Yeah. Um, when I actually started road cycling, uh, it didn't come easy. Before that, I had done a few kids races where I, I did win. But when I really started uh, road cycling, I was second to last, third to last. And it, it didn't look good. Uh, but uh, but pretty soon I I put a goal for myself that I wanted to be uh, as good as my friend and the other friends in in the in the club at that moment uh, when I turn 18. So that was my first goal, and and more or less when I was 18, I was uh, at the same level as them and could start competing with the national team and going to to some races in Holland and uh, and. Um, Germany and and um, yeah Denmark Sweden of course yeah and then uh, you you did eventually find yourself into the the pro ranks and and starting off with with smaller teams and then moving on to liquid gas and and team sky so you had a a long and and uh, you know quite quite impressive career then you did retire and then move into this role as as a leader and and as a manager of people 
when you reflect upon that experience of actually being a rider, you know, training, competing, do you think that there were things you learned as a rider that have actually helped you to, to make that transition? Are there skills or, or behaviours that you acquired being an athlete that you find are also useful for you now in, in a leadership position? Um, uh, for sure. Uh, I think that everything that we learn, uh, if or let's say like this, all the experiences that we have will forge you into what you are now. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that I had a, a lot of different experiences with 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 uh, DSs and and team managers when I was a, a young rider, not yet pro, uh, and then going into the pro side with Amore Vita and then Liquid Gas and and and, and Sky. I saw a lot of different uh, leadership styles, and um, I, for, for sure, I think um, all these experiences they they gave then uh, what I what I know now and and how I like to treat people um, and how I like to be treated, uh, and that reflects in in what I perceived before. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, it's fantastic. I'll just take, I'll add a little little bit more into this. Kel, um, so when you retired from cycling, did you have a gap, a bit of time free before you stepped into a leadership role or did you step straight into it straight away the year after you stopped? No, the, the thing was that uh, uh, when, I, when I quit cycling or road cycling, it was a little bit, uh, it was a surprise for me because I hadn't planned it that I would end my career then. Mm. Um, so that was a little bit... Um, I, I thought I was almost sure to continue, but uh, yeah, the thing was that Sky was uh, e e evolving and, and get going more into both sprinting and, and GC, and there wasn't room for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I found that out a little bit too late to be able to convince another team on the same level or, or like in the World Tour um, to get me. And um, I found a few other options, but at the same time we were getting our second kid. So I decided I don't want to go back to Pro Conti and then restart building my career. I, I, I preferred to, to stop then. And um, actually when, when that happened, uh, I was living in Switzerland and, and then I, I stayed as, a, as an unemployed in Switzerland for the following year and was looking at different options of, of what to do. I started up a, a couple of businesses in Finland. Uh, one was, uh, or is still working, but it's it's a coaching business. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, yeah, then uh, I, I thought I would leave cycling. Actually, uh, I didn't think that I would continue in any um, position. Uh, when I was a rider, I had a maybe a, a skewed vision uh, and thought that sitting in the car and being a DS is not so interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't think I would uh, enjoy it. But then uh, when I was looking for jobs, um, I got called up from the RCS and, and um, they asked me to come and drive the VIP car. And um, um, yeah, I said, uh, yeah, I don't have anything else to do in, in May. So why not come to the Giro and drive the car? Uh, I like driving, so that's fine. And I know about cycling, so I can talk with the clients. And um, I enjoyed it so much that I started to uh, question myself why I leave the, the sport that I love so much. So uh, then I started to look around and see what options there were and talk with Dave Brailsford about uh, maybe doing something with, with Sky in, uh, in that year. And he proposed to come and do the same thing what I was doing for RCS in the tour with uh, Sky. Mm. I was happy to jump on that occasion and, uh, and uh, yeah. Then after that, uh, I ended up with I Am Cycling just because, yeah, I was starting to do I mean, for, it's, for it's interesting that um, you know, we've, we've, we've talked to some other, you know, people working as DSs, as, as leaders in, in the world of cycling. And one of the things that has come up in, in some of those discussions is the fact that sometimes the best, the, the people who make the best leaders in terms of leading teams, whether that's in cycling or often in, in the business world as well, often they're not the people who were perhaps the ones who had the highest level of natural talent for whom winning came easily. Do you have a perspective on that? I mean, because clearly you were talented, you were good, but um, you know, you may not have been in that same echelon of the, you know, the, 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 the incredibly gifted people like the Contadors or the, 
um, the Sagans that we see in the peloton today. Um, what's, what's your view on that? You know, the, the truly talented leader versus the, the, the person who's been a teammate, a team member, a helper themselves and the, what they bring to a leadership role. Yeah, it, it's, it's, I've thought about it uh, several times and I, I, I don't think that you can take and, and draw with the combo on, on everybody. Like you cannot say the same thing uh, works for everybody, but I do think that there is a bigger uh, chance of, of a helper or domestic to actually be able to, to then develop into a good leader just because you have always been looking at all the different scenarios and, and looking at from different perspectives than when you are a star. Um, that's how I, uh, how I see it. I mean, uh, of course, I was a little bit inclined in, in looking at the other side, not just from the rider's perspective already when I was a rider. Um, and I was, uh, for a short time, I was uh, uh, um, in, in the CPA um, and, and I like to involve myself in, in, in these decision makings behind the scenes or if there were any uh, and, and if there was any other possibility of, of um, yeah, giving, giving ideas to the team, how we can perform better and things like this. So, um, yeah, I, I do believe that there, yeah, if, yeah, if you have a, uh, this kind of vision, then it helps. I'm not sure then if, if it, if it's a big difference, if you're a star or if you're a domestic, but potentially a little bit better for domestics easier. That's good. It's good. It's good to seeing seeing you smile again too, Gail, from time to time because you got a fantastic smile. But we, you, sometimes we we do in these interviews see people getting a little bit serious, so we have to give you a reminder to uh, to keep smiling. Yeah, no. The <laughs> thing is that when you start to think about it, uh, it's difficult to keep smiling and think. <laughs> okay. Maybe, maybe maybe that's a very maybe that's a very uniquely Finnish characteristic because I have worked in Finland a lot, and I think you're right. When Finnish people start to think, they don't smile very much. True. No. No. <laughs> Let's go forward a little bit, mate. Let's tell us a little bit more at uh, the present time with uh, Israel Startup Nation, uh, your general manager. Let's tell us a little bit more about the, the team and the project and, and where you want to take it. Yeah, so um, after I'm Cycling stopped in 2016, yep. uh, I was again uh, without a job and I was looking around and and I didn't uh, really know where to go. I, th I thought I, I contacted all the World Tour teams, most, most of them at least, and... Um, yeah, it was uncertain times at that moment. And then there were several people asking me, to, what, have you checked with the Israelis? What Israelis first? And then later I, uh, they, they told me the name and then, yeah, okay, so I better call Ran Margaliot. Uh, so I called him and he, he explained a little bit about the, the philosophy of the team. And I, I thought that seems really interesting. Like um, there's a culture where they, they want to uh, develop uh, the Israeli cycling and get the Israeli riders to eventually get to the tour. Uh, so it is a little bit similar to what we have been doing in, in I am cycling developing. Yeah. Partly it was the Swiss, but of course we developed the whole team to, to become uh, a world tour team in, in, in a few years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so it was intriguing, uh, already the concept and, and, um, uh, at the same time, it looked to be something bigger than just a uh, cycling team. Like there is a project behind it. Um, and that is actually still the case. Um, uh, the idea is that it has grown. Uh, in the beginning, it was to get a, one or a few Israelis to the, to the tour. But now it's to actually get the team to the tour. Uh, and uh, and uh, now when we have reached the world tour status, then... Well, what should the next uh, step be? I'll try to be the best possible World Tour team that we can be, I think. So, yeah, things are evolving all the time. And um, that's something that I, I really like um, in, in this kind of uh, position. Yeah. Fantastic. And you, you've, you've had a, um, I mean, it's been an incredible few months with COVID-19. I mean, what have you learned as a leader, you know, being apart from, from your your employees, from your team members, and of course from the riders, and not only being apart from the riders, but those riders being apart from each other also. How do you keep people kind of motivated and focused at a time like this? Well, I, I think that there are two different uh, 
aspects to this. One is the financial. Uh, and since we are in a fortunate situation where we haven't had uh, the need to cut salaries or anything like this, it is much easier to give the security to all the, the personnel and, uh, and also the riders. Uh, I think it would be a complete different situation if we would have had to cut salaries, then we would have had to much more go, yeah, I would say do things to make sure that we are motivated and, and, and keep the faith in that things will get better. Um, but now what we have done is to try, uh, I mean, I, I, one thing that I have learned is that uh, I should communicate more with everybody. Uh, that's something that I can already say now that I haven't done. I haven't done enough. Uh, sometimes it's difficult though, because uh, there's so many different things that I've been doing. So um, yeah, you have to you have to keep it in mind, and that's something that I need to get better at. Um, but um, but we have tried to tackle it from a different perspective, where we say, okay, we don't have too many other things to do, so let's try to figure out uh, our best approach to when the racing restarts or actually even before so for example thinking about uh, protocols and thinking about the future um, and and planning towards that and see whether there could be even some opportunities uh, for us as, as we are quite a stable team in in, in that yeah economical ac aspect Fantastic, Mal. I'll just add another question to this topic. Uh, I know you guys have been heavily into the the new uh, topic of the the virtual cycling world. Uh, you guys have been competing in the races. Um, for me personally, it's been absolute, uh, you know, excitement to be able to watch a live sporting event, let alone be the one that I most love uh, on on Eurosport, for example, live. Um, how's your, what's your opinion? Over this last, you know, pandemic era that we've been in in, in confinement, how, how have you how have you found the the new concept with the cycling uh, virtual world, mate? Yeah, it's actually pretty funny because uh, I, I personally I hated to stay on the rollers, and like uh, I, I I had to think, but I don't own rollers, so I I wanted to go uh, online for a few <laughs> for a few occasions, but I couldn't because I didn't have them, but. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, uh, it is a tricky one because it's great to do it. It's, it's great to have something that you can do, uh, especially when in, in countries like in, in Spain, France and uh, Italy, where it was complete lockdown and you couldn't go out. So absolutely fabulous to be able to race online, um, not only ride on the trainer. So that was, I, I think it was a great uh, opportunity um, and we found it re very good to be part of those uh, races and, and to have a little bit of um, excitement for everybody uh, and, and to stay involved in the, in the social media and all. Um, but at the same time, it's something that it takes out a lot of energy out of the riders because um, you have, let's say, at the, at the moment, in the beginning of this uh, COVID uh, uh, period we didn't know how long it will last so first we thought okay let's at least say that there's nothing going to happen until may but we knew that it most probably going to take longer so um yeah so maybe a f for a few days uh, even a week some riders were taking it easier but then they started really properly train again and trying to work on their gaps that uh, that now was a good possibility of of really um, yeah uh, breaching uh, or bridging those uh, those gaps and um, yeah so the thing is that when you do a really really hard effort on a, on a race then you have to uh, recover maybe it takes one day or maybe even two days because they are so intensive and if you do one and a half hours full gas uh, yeah, inside where you, you sweat a lot and the, the yeah, heart rate is high higher than normal then yeah it takes a long time to recover okay uh, maybe as a as a final question um you mentioned that you had the chance both as a rider now also as a as a leader within a team yourself to have worked with other great leaders and what would you see i mean based upon your experience what would be 
for you to the maybe three or four attributes of, of a really great leader uh, in the context of, of pro cycling? Well, I think it always comes down to having a vision. It doesn't matter what the vision is really, but uh, if you don't have a vision, it's difficult to work towards a goal. And, and, and so that's number one, I think. Um, the second thing that I would like in a leader is that to be able to listen to, to everybody. Uh, we have a, uh, in, in our team, I try to bring on that it doesn't matter who you are, you can always come with ideas. And we will listen to the ideas and we will try to take those um, into our project. And maybe, well, sometimes you can say that it doesn't work, but sometimes maybe that idea that we couldn't use uh, brings something else. So uh, always listen to, to everybody. Um, and um, yeah, the, I think, uh, yeah, the third one, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what would be the best attribute but uh, yeah I think um, being being able to 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 keep some kind of a, a structure um, uh, that's that's very important I mean the one that is the leader that he has to put the, the structure in place and how it should work and and it comes a little bit with the vision uh, where you want to head and and uh, but yeah if you have the insight in in the in the sport of cycling and on how things could work it doesn't have to be that um, yeah, it all works in, in perfectly at the moment because in the end uh, money makes a big difference uh, if you have the, the 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 means to do all the different things uh, but yeah, you can try to utilize your resources in the best possible way and uh, and try to build towards where, where you want to be. Great. Thank you. So have a vision, engage the people, and then execute the plan. I mean, it sound, sounds yeah. like, so, sounds easy, sounds easy, but I guess in practice, perhaps not as easy uh, as it sounds. So, Jell Kallstrom, thank you so much uh, for joining us on this Leadership Bites. I think some wonderful insights from you, um, not just about the world of pro cycling, but I think... Uh, about leadership um, more widely. Um, for those of you who've watched this video, if you have enjoyed it, please do give us the thumbs up uh, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we look forward to seeing you uh, on a future episode of This Cycling Life.